We are iConnections, and it's time to talk about change. To work together and rebalance our global systems. To create a more equitable world for everyone. To celebrate women and their achievements. Acknowledge their trials and their triumphs. To challenge biases and recognize that the leadership of women is essential. We choose to invest in our future because equality is non-negotiable for investment. And change emerges from leadership. We must overcome discrimination, challenge gender inequality, and balance our responsibilities. Every challenge comes with a choice. I choose to challenge. I choose to challenge. We, we choose, choose to challenge. challenge. Welcome to the next session in the Changemakers Forum, Lessons from Science, Academia, and Philanthropy. This session is sponsored by Bloomberg, the global leader in financial data, news, and insight. Bloomberg uses the power of technology to connect the world's decision makers. The Changemakers Forum leads us to examine diversity and inclusion in sectors outside of the investment industry. Our panel today invites leaders in science and academia to share their views on these questions. I'm proud to introduce Helen Shersky, a British oceanographer, physicist, and senior lecturer at UCLA. Helen is one of the UK's most compelling science communicators, publishing books such as Storm in a Teacup, The Physics of Everyday Life, and giving televised lectures for the Royal Institution, a must-have on any scientist's bucket list. She is joined by Susan Leoto, professor at Stanford University and managing director of the Susan Leoto and Associates Consultancy on Ethics. The former CIO of Harvard Endowment, Susan is also the author of The Power of Ethics. Helen and Susan are joined by Miriam Gonzalez Durantes, the vice chair at UBS Europe, partner at Cohen and Gresser, and a founding member of the Inspiring Girls charity, dedicated to raising the aspirations of young girls around the world by connecting them with female role models. Leading this conversation is Dr. Linda Yu, economist, broadcaster, and writer. She is a fellow in economics at St. Edmund Hall, University of Oxford, and host of Business Daily. Her latest book, The Great Economist, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today, was one of the Times' business books of the year. We hope you enjoy this session. Hello and welcome to this iConnections and Intelligence Squared event with me, Linda Yu. I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing this fantastic panel on International Women's Day. Our topic is choosing to challenge lessons from other industries, science, academia, philanthropy, and much more. On that much more, <laughs> I'm going to now introduce our panelists who will be taking us through these issues. So first up, I've got Miriam Gonzalez Durante. She's of counsel at Cohen and Gresser LLP, vice chair of the supervisory board of UBS Europe and founding member of Inspiring Girls, a charity dedicated to raising the aspirations of young girls around the world by connecting them with female role models. We're also joined by Helen Chersky. She's an oceanographer, physicist and television presenter. She's a lecturer at University College London, holds a PhD in experimental explosives physics, and is the author of Storm in a Teacup, The Physics of Everyday Life. And we're also joined by Susan Leotol. She's lecturer at Stanford University and founder and managing director of Susan Leotol and Associates Limited, a consultancy that advises businesses on ethics. She is the author of The Power of Ethics, How to Make Good Choices in a Complicated World. What a fantastic panel to delve into this question. So we will delve right in. I'm gonna start by asking each of you what gender equality in the workplace means to you. Is it a pay gap? Is it culture? Is it something else? Or is it all of the above? So Miriam, I'm gonna to come to you first on this one. 
Well, for me, it is all of that together. It is a workplace where legality is met so that women are paid for the same job as much as men, where there are no pay gaps, where there are enough women to represent society and the amount of you know, the over 50% that we are in society. It is a place where the culture is inclusive for women, where there is no harassment, where there is no special patronizing attitudes towards women. But to me, I think that we cannot really distinguish between equality in the workplace and equality at home. I think that the burden that many women have at home really crosses over to the workplace. And for many years, we have looked at all, all that like separate pillars. I think that it is about time that we start looking at them together. Thank you very much, Miriam. Susan, I'm gonna to come to you on the same question. What does gender equality mean to you? So I very much agree with everything Miriam just said. So I'll just build on it a little bit. Um, one is that when we think about uh, women, we need to think about gender more broadly and we need to think about gender identity more broadly and equality in all respects. Um, we also need to think about the intersection between gender and race um, and other questions um, as well, age, um, socioeconomic situation. And then finally, I would just broaden the lens a little bit and say that the question of gender in general needs to be embedded in every decision an organization makes. So when I chair a board, I consider governance about decision-making and I'm making sure that this question is embedded in every question we look at and including when a crisis hits and we can come to talking about COVID perhaps a bit later, but um, what are different moments in time when different events or different strategic decisions of an organization may impact women differently? Great, thank you very much. Um, Helen, same question to you. What does gender equality mean to you? Well, of course, I'm not going to disagree with any of that. So I'm just going to add a little bit more. And my addition is about the value system, because I think that a lot of the effort that goes into creating an equal workplace has this underlying assumption that nobody questions, which is that the value system in those workplaces, what gets recorded, uh, re rewarded, what you're aiming for is set by men because it's what was set last a decade ago or 10 decades ago. And I think actually, um, one of the critical parts in gender equality is having an equal say in the value system that underpins everything else. Everybody wants to get good stuff done fundamentally one way or another, but there are what counts as good stuff. And I think that we don't talk enough, you know, Susan touched on it a little bit, there's, there's a diversity of ways of looking at all of these things. And so we need equality in the value system, not just in different people being valued but in what we value do we value being good human beings do we value you know genuine diversity what do we value and i think that is an important part of what you need to have gender equality in the workplace great great, great start um, and now let's move to um exploring a bit about the impact of the pandemic um, so actually, Susan, can I come to you? So over the past year or so, um, we have seen dramatic changes um, due to the pandemic in the world of work and certainly elsewhere. Um, how do, would you view the changes um, that COVID has brought and the potential impact that has on women? So first of all, let me thank you for the question um, and, and just say to everybody who's listening who has suffered from COVID in one way or another, whether it's loss, whether it's illness, whether it's supporting people around them, uh, or whether it's economic or professional consequences, you know, my heart goes out to everybody. This has just been, you know, a, a very, very, um, very, very difficult time for so many. Um, women in particular have been influenced in a number of ways. One is that clearly um, in a number of situations, Miriam mentioned the home environment. Women have disproportionate responsibility for childcare. Um, children are having to be homeschooled or be kept home from, from childcare. Um, that makes it virtually impossible to work at the same time, you know, at a minimum, absolutely exhausting, but in many cases and in many situations of home environments, impossible. Um, we're seeing women who have had to stop out of the workforce or lose their jobs. Um, men have lost their jobs as well, of course, but stopping out for a bit can mean an effect on pensions. Um, and can have an effect on longer term career opportunities and particularly in a difficult economy. 
So I think there's no question that we've seen all kinds of inequality. And again, I'll broaden the lens and just say, we've seen terrible racial and socioeconomic inequality about how the virus has, has hit, um, how, the, how we're managing it, um, the decision-making that's gone on with everything from vaccines to you know, who needs to be at work. Um, but there's no question that we need to keep in mind and use COVID as an example, that crisis can hit women differently and certain groups differently. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, Helen, I'm going to come to you um, on the pandemic in terms of accelerating digitalization in society as well. So with more and more of us relying on algorithms and tech in our daily lives, there's a lot that's been written about the potential bias in ethics and AI. And are you concerned that technological change could exasperate any discrimination, inequality, um, and have a disproportionate effect on women? Yes, of course. So I think what we've learned about the pandemic is that really it just amplifies inequalities that were already there. And any rapid change is probably going to do the same because you, you base it on, on what you have before. I think there's a more interesting thing here, which I and I don't have any data for this. I do think it's something I see. I feel I have seen and I would be interested in, in the opinions of um, Miriam and Susan on this is that quite aside from the work in the home, the digital environment allows a much more collaborative workplace. And I think most people would agree that's a good idea. It's easy to have a Zoom meeting, check in with everyone, check everything's going well. But along with that, which is often considered a better way of working things, there's a lot of conflict resolution and there's a lot of organizing. There's a lot of invisible overhead, which comes with this new digital world. And what I see is that women are being asked to do more of that. And it's kind of more of that unpaid it's more of doing the washing up in some ways you know the unpaid labor that doesn't get seen the glue that holds everything together the things that we have heard for years that women in the workplace are expected to just you know sort of sort out the messes and deal with the awkward bits and it's the women's offices who people's go people go to when they have a problem or a bad day right and and so one of the things that worries me about the digital world is i think all this increased collaboration is brilliant but I also think that it comes with this overhead that nobody is talking about yet. And I see that burden falling on women because they are on average in, you know, big, broad um, statistical sense. They are they go in with a conf with conflict resolution rather than conflict creation as their default mode. And so so I'm very interested in how we. You know, I'm not. I don't think the digital. We have a. I don't. The digital world just reflects the human world. Um, but what we see is that the digital world is being built mostly by men, and um, so we have to obviously watch for bias there. But also these issues of it comes with its own overheads. Yes, it's more efficient in some ways, but there are other other ways where it does take. There has to be glue gluing things together behind the scenes, and we have to make sure that that burden doesn't fall disproportionately on women. And um, Miriam, I'm going to bring you in actually on both these questions, um, because I think a number of fascinating points have been raised. I've got in my mind a digital um, world now that mirrors the physical world and all the issues there. But um, just to get your take, Miriam, on these as well. Well, I think that in terms of, of COVID and the effect of, of the pandemic, nothing good comes from a pandemic ever, right? And, and uh, Always what we see is that when there is something like a pandemic that has a tremendous economic impact that we are going to continue seeing during the years to, to come, the ones that suffer most are the ones with the worst jobs. So that is what, why we are seeing that women are being disproportionately affected and we are going to continue seeing it just as we saw it in 2008. Uh, I think that there is another element, I think it was Susan who, who uh, picked on that, which is that, of course, from the moment that you have the children at home and there is no safety network in terms of, it's not only the children, but also organizing the houses and all that, <laughs> it falls primarily on women because it falls every day primarily on women. So whenever there is a pandemic, you know, that, that change is nothing. It continues falling, but just more on them. For, for me, I, mean, I think that there are two uh, possible angles that perhaps we can, we can use positively in the future. One of them is to have seen that we can all do remote, we cannot all, many of us can do <laughs> remote working. And I think that that facilitates a discussion that we have tried to have for years about flexible 
work. You know, we were being told this is absolutely impossible. Our productivity would fall. You know, in law firms, for example, where I work, it, it was just impossible to have this discussion with all their partners. Suddenly, everybody has moved remotely in some of those firms, for example, they are making more money than they did in the previous years. So, so perhaps it revolutionizes a bit the discussion about flexible working. And to me, the other interesting point is that we have seen during the tough lockdowns what it takes for a society to be able to be productive. So if we don't have um, people taking care of the children, if we don't have hygienic houses and somebody doing that, if we don't have people cooking healthy uh, food, et cetera, et cetera, just forget gender. We simply cannot work as a society and be productive and generate the growth that we need to continue functioning. <laughs> and I think that it has put the spotlight and a magnifier on that, which has been a taboo discussion for many years. We have started talking about the, the unequal burden sharing on childcare a little bit, but not so much in terms of domestic work. And I hope that we use this to start talking about it because, you know, women do on average in OECD countries, in rich countries, four hours and a half more unpaid work, not just childcare, but also in the houses. So, so we really need to discuss about it. One brief point on digitalization. I, I feel much more the, the increased digitalization during um, this pandemic. Than, than the algorithms. Now, I think that we need to distinguish a little bit the discussion about digitalization and algorithms. The algorithms, they could replicate discriminatory um, values and assessments. It's all in the governance. I think it was Susan who mentioned governance earlier. Now, behind the algorithms, there are people. So how are we going to organize the governance of those decisions? In terms of digitalization, I personally think that is mostly a really good thing. I haven't really seen that distinction of women being the ones who are asked to more to, to organize all that organizational work that comes with the, with the digital world. And, and I, I would caution a little bit about um, putting the label on women on, on conflict resolution and men, the conflict creators. You know, I think that it's all rather, I know lots of women <laughs> who are uh, conflict resolution people and many others who are conflict creators and the same with with men. Uh, thank you, Miriam. It's actually a good segue to get into what works and what doesn't work, um, because I think we've now set the scene and obviously there's an, a number of issues um, and the pandemic has only highlighted um, the urgency, I think, of dealing with a number of these issues around gender um, equality. So. Um, Susan, I want to come to you um, on this question about, you know, there have been obviously lots of debate um, about whether or not companies too often put the onus on individuals um, to root out inequality instead of saying focus on structural inequalities like, um, like culture, um, which can often play a role in deciding who gets promoted, who gets hired. Um, so it'd be great to get your take on this assessment. Um, and you know what role culture or values um, can play in rooting out inequality. I've just taken Helen's word values there, Susan. Uh, and Helen's word is, is important. Um, so I think it has to be both. It has to be at the organizational level, which means the board, which means the management team, which means the structures and the approaches to hiring, the, the approaches to assessing compensation, the approaches to making sure data is collected on all of those things. But then it also has to be um, on each individual. And, um, and I'll come back to what I said earlier about the quality of decision-making. I don't think that there are any decisions in an organization that don't have gender as a component. So it isn't a separate agenda item. It isn't a separate data set. It isn't a certification process or a hoop to jump through. It's really part and parcel of every decision we make. I think, um, at the macro level, um, we need to distinguish between processes. So for example, what's the hiring process? Do we use external um, headhunters? Do we use blind hiring? Do we use algorithms to hire? Um, and so that's a process point versus the outcome that we want. So an example of where that can go off the rails is you know, with blind hiring processes um, that may seem to eradicate gender and racial bias. But at the end of the day, the veils are lifted and interviews happen. 
And, you know, we need to ask ourselves, is that depriving women, for, for example, of an opportunity to explain why they stepped out of the workforce for three years to have children and what they might have learned from that that would be valuable when they try to come back in. So we need to be very careful about assuming that some of these processes are all good. Um, uh, we do need to track the data uh, and we do need to be aware, though, that it, it is everybody's responsibility um, to, to Miriam's earlier point about also a workplace free of harassment um, and free of stressors like that, that's sort of where culture comes in. But I personally define culture as what comes out of the decision process. So again, lots of decisions are made at all levels of the organization and that creates a culture. And, um, and we definitely need to be mindful of how the decisions we make are driving an environment that is or is not free of harassment, that is or is not conducive to women asking for mentors, asking for raises, asking for opportunities, you know, up a different branch of the tree if the one that they're on for whatever reason doesn't seem to be working out. Um, and I, I'll end by just saying that I think we do need to be very mindful of speech in the workplace now. Um, it's it, free speech questions and, and freedom of expression are coming into the workplace in all kinds of ways, in part individual and uh, organizational use of social media, in part what's happening in society. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the, I reduce the one culture point around that to respect. And, you know, and it's not just again about women, um, but just to making sure that in, in all of the behaviors in the office, there's a fundamental element of respect. And to Helen's earlier point that these, this kind of decision-making, the, the values that we want to have, um, the processes of evaluation, the prioritizing, issues around gender equality is rewarded as much as the sales target um, or as much as any other performance metric. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, Helen, I'm gonna to come to you on the same question. Um, is too much onus being placed on um, individuals, you think, um, rather than say um, the very complicated set of um, issues that um, Susan has outlined around processes and much else? So I recognize, I recognize why you asked the question. I'm also going to question a little bit the way you asked the question, because I think there's this, this is what happens in debates, right? It's a, is it this or is it this? And it's set out as a binary decision. And I'm, I'm not criticizing you for doing that because that is your job as host in this situation. But I think that there are, one of the issues here is that um, decisions can be nuanced. And a lot of the world we work in is, is it this or is it this? And there isn't time taken to dig down and say, actually, is there a middle ground? And I have, so I, I hear what Susan said about culture being the decisions that are made, but I also think how decisions are made is important because you need transparency. And I think one of the good things perhaps to come out of this, of the pandemic is that there's been a leveling. I think it's easier, you know, technology has brought this. It's easier to hear the voices of more people. It's easy to have more people in a virtual room. And one of the biggest barriers to equality of any kind is lack of transparency because if you can't see that the person in the office next door is being paid three times what you're paid for doing the same job you'll never know there's any inequality to complain about so I think the process of decision making is not just about um, being transparent about what's happening and why but it's also um, you know sort of um, lost my train of thought a bit it's also about um, being like accepting nuance it's not this or this if we all have a discussion together which involves equality maybe there's a middle way it doesn't have to be a black or white decision actually if a woman you know takes maternity leave uh, or a bloke takes paternity leave actually which you know is less more of a problem these days um it's not an either or, it's not they're a good person or a bad person. It's that we can all adjust what we all think about the situation. We can bear in mind the nuances. And then everyone, instead of seeing it as a war where it's my decision or your decision, it's, oh, well, this person did this, it's all transparent. And so this other person, you know, we can sort of check that everyone's doing their bit in the workforce, however you phrase that. So I think that the way decisions are made and accepting that nuance is a critical part and not being afraid of it is really important for equality because people are different. There's no way that you can exactly evaluate, you know, as Susan was saying, you can't exactly evaluate a woman who took three years out to have children against someone else who didn't. But if you talk about the nuances, then you can pick them apart. So I think that the, 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 the process of decision-making also has to change for real equality. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Helen. Mary, I'm going to bring you in um, on this question as well, um, in terms of 
a nuanced assessment of the of uh, how I'm much uh, <laughs> is on the no 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 you know as you say sort of uh, my role to put the sides here and the arguments um, but perfectly um, agree um, you know that is um, it's often it's like the first question we ask it's all of the above. It's all of these things. The question is, you know, Mary, it'd be good to get your, um, you know, your stresses on, you know, which bits to focus on, perhaps. So, well, it it is indeed um, all of that, and it's also slightly different from sector to sector, from company to to company. You know, there are lots of initiatives that have been put in place in different companies um, over the the last few years. I I actually think that some progress has been made in that companies are talking more to each other and they they are mirroring a little bit more the initiatives that uh, they put in place. And I have seen myself how we went from um, uh, the mentoring to the sponsoring, um, all the uh, anti-bias training, et cetera, et cetera, you know, networking initiatives, all that is great. My my only... um, issue there probably from practical experience is that we need to distinguish between all those initiatives and talking about them and trying to get more and more companies um, implementing them. And and the the concept, you know, in environmental discussions, we talk about greenwashing. (laughs) And sometimes in gender discussions in the workplace, I think that there is a little bit of gender washing, you know, that the companies just put in place three initiatives, they throw it there, they put a page in their website, you say, well, aren't we great? We are doing lots of different things. Now, you continue seeing exactly the same issues <laughs> being reproduced year after year, but they say, oh, no, but we are doing all these. And so, so to me, I think that the key, whatever it is that the solution is, which may be different for different companies and workplaces, the key is on something that I think that Susan touched upon, And it's like, who is responsible? So in the organization, if we see that we have a problem, you know, we normally deal with it saying, who is responsible? And how are we going to make their financial rewards linked to that responsibility that they have so that we are going to make them accountable for this area of responsibility that we have given to them? That rarely ever happens on gender discussions. Now it's like, oh, we try. And we don't get it done. Now. Oh, well, sorry. No, it's like, no, who was responsible for this? Well, I tell you, this year you are not going to have your bonus in full or, or whatever it is. You will see how quickly we make progress if we start attaching figures to all that. Uh, Miriam, you mentioned there, um, you know, companies do try to uh, work in this area through unconscious bias training, mentorship programs. It sounds like you've had experience of these. So it'd be good to get your assessment on whether or not those are ways forward and how effective you found them. I do think that they are useful. I have done plenty of, of all that. And, uh, and, and in my own experience, for example, I have found that, that the sponsorship uh, was more uh, effective um, than simply mentoring. Um, I have found, for example, that whenever you involve men into the sponsorship, um, it was more effective in some of our organizations. So you mix um, men and women, certainly unconscious bias training. I think it is very useful. I have found myself that, you know, there were some decisions that I would take or that I wasn't aware myself (laughs) of some of the issues that could be behind it. And I think that all that, all that helps. Now, whether all that on its own changes <laughs> the culture and what needs to be changed in terms of the gender balance in the workplace. That is what sometimes I have a, a bit of an issue with. And I, I think that that is where we need to make people specifically responsible with the change. Thank you, Mary. Helen. I just wanted to add a very quick point, which is that I, you know, like all of us, I guess, have been through unconscious bias training. And the last time it happened in my academic department, um, one guy at the end uh, and he was um, not born in the UK and he said well that's all very well but it's not unconscious bias that's the problem it's conscious bias and in a way it was one of the most chilling phrases I'd ever heard because I you know live in a a world where I can sort of pretend we've moved on from a lot of these issues I you know I, I live in a very very liberal society that doesn't question that I'm a female physicist that goes out on ships and does all this stuff but to hear someone 
actually just wind it back to no this is the there's conscious bias right you can play your games with unconscious bias and like Miriam I think this is important but actually there's a whole load of conscious bias that is still out there and we can't ignore that we, we do we do need to remember to challenge it because it is real thank you Helen Susan um, yes I just wanted to come back in on a couple of really important points that were made first of all I agree with Miriam we've all had countless experiences with all of these programs and trainings and I guess my attitude is that, yes, they're better than nothing. I mean, they're not the answer, but it's certainly better to be having a conversation about unconscious bias. And I as well have learned from these things. But what I tend to do is to say, those are actions and what I wanna see is outcomes. So uh, it isn't enough when I see, for example, on a board that I'm chairing, when I see all the things that were done, that's not enough, that's the start of the discussion. The rest of the discussion is, so what was the result that was achieved? Um, and this needs to happen to your earlier question about individuals. It needs to happen at all levels of a company. It needs to happen at the level of holding senior management to account, but it needs to happen all the way down the chain so that even very junior managers have to say things in their performance evaluations like, what is your plan regarding gender bias this year? What are the concrete actions you're going to take that relate in particular to your team? And in some teams, it might be hiring. In some teams, it might be behavioral. Not everybody's going to do everything, but I try to work very hard um, on driving ethics throughout organizations. Um, the other thing is on Helen's point about, I couldn't agree more about binary. I mean, the first chapter of my book is called Banish the Binary, but I do think we need to draw some lines. There are some things that are binary, meaning absolutely unacceptable. And one of them is racism and one of them is sexual harassment. Um, and so when we see things like that, I do think we have to be very careful that we don't get into these discussions about, well, under the circumstances or there's nuance here or any of that. I do think leaders need to draw very clear lines. And in fact, again, all the way down the organization, we need to be drawing clear lines about that. Mm. Uh, Susan, just to follow up on other initiatives. So you've begun to outline, and I think all of you have touched on various ways in which organizations um, you know, should be um, acting. So can you just sort of um, maybe recap a bit on how, what other types um, of, you know, stepping back, if you can generalize a bit, you know, what would you like to see organizations do to get to the outcome of gender equality that you don't see them doing enough of? So the first is a, is a broad brush look at the way ethics is driven through the organization generally, and that can be AI bias and it can be sexual misconduct and it can be gender bias. And that is to make sure everybody understands that it, to Miriam's earlier point, it's everybody's responsibility, but also everybody can make a difference and without making it their full-time day job, it just can't, it can't run properly. And, you know, I work mostly at the most senior level and then they drive it down is, you know, how do you integrate ethics in your decisions so that it becomes a habit and not a burden? Um, and so that it really just starts to drive the spread of positive ethics instead of the spread of negative ethics, whether it's gender issues or others. Um, but the other thing is I would say, um, and, I'll, and I'll give a concrete example, we all need to be asking ourselves, you know, what is the world telling us that we're not seeing? So a really good example that's related to bias is, um, you know, Airbnb had a number of issues around racial bias um, in the early days, and they worked very hard to clean that up. And I give the management a lot of credit. They told the truth about it. They acknowledged it. They were transparent to Helen's point. They're, they're working hard to clean it up. But in a sense, it was right there in front of them. It's an internet company. And we all knew that race, uh, race you know, sort of racial, uh, racially inappropriate comment is all over the internet. And it's a, you know, basically a hospitality industry company. And we all knew, especially in the US, um, that you're not allowed to discriminate in inns and hotels and restaurants. So somehow putting hospitality together with the internet, even though race was a terrible issue in both, when these entrepreneurs put them together, it didn't occur to them to think about, well, how can race be an issue on their platform? And so we need to be asking ourselves, you know, where are these issues lurking that we might not see them? Um, and I'll, I'll just end this comment with, you know, coming back to AI. If you're driving AI through a financial services institution, is it going to negatively or disproportionately negatively impact women in credit ratings, for example? So we need to be sort of really on the lookout for, for, for risks and for things the world is telling us that we're not quite seeing. Thank you, Susan. Uh, same question to you, Miriam, in terms of initiatives um, in the workforce. You've obviously outlined, um, you know, changes. So again, you know, stepping back, you know, what kind of other, um, in addition, um, initiatives that you would like to see 
um, to get the outcome of gender equality. Well, if I, if I may pick on, on uh, one comment that Susan has made, I think it, it may be true that there are some areas where there is some hidden bias or some hidden discrimination, but we should not kid ourselves. The majority of the issues that we find on gender equality in the workplace are open issues. They are simple mm -hmm. issues to, to a spot. You know, I live right now in Silicon Valley. If there are women living at twice the rate as men from the tech companies, that is not, you know, for making a study as to why is that happening, how difficult it is. You know, generally, it is simple to see <laughs> what are the issues. It's just a lack of, of will to really tackle them properly. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that with any other areas. You know, Susan, you were talking about ethics. I deal, for example, with a lot of, you know, money laundry issues or anti-corruption issues, you know, and, and it's the same dynamic that you were mentioning. It's like, we should all deal with those issues in the organization, but then in addition, what? We put somebody in charge of them so that they evaluate whether the training is working, whether the networking is working, whether whatever it is, the many of initiatives that may be different for every company. And then we come to it and we say, well, this didn't work out this year. So how are we going to do it differently? Because for me, that is the, the big difference between gender and pretty much everything else that goes on in the workplace. That on gender, when we see year after year that it doesn't work and it doesn't produce the results that we want, we continue doing the same things. <laughs> so that is the bit, in my view, that has to change. Mm, thank you, Miriam. Isn't that Einstein's definition of insanity? You do the same things over and over again and you hope for a different outcome. Um, Helen, I can see you there nodding. Same question to you. What initiatives would you like to see um, in academia or other walks of life that you've um, worked in? Well, I have two, there are two things that come to mind. So the first one is that whatever your initiative is, the organization has to be committed to changing themselves. Like I am tired of hearing that this is women's fault. The women haven't, aren't uh, assertive enough. The women don't do this. The women, never mind that, right? You're not gonna, it's not, it's not on, frankly, at all to say, we're just going to train those people to fit into our way of doing things. What you need to, first of all, acknowledge is that the, the reason, you know, the way you run your organization might well have to change. And that means changing you and what you do in your job and your attitudes. And so, um, and I see, so, so I think that's the first thing that that has to come up front. If you want to use the, the phrasing of outcomes, if the outcome of your company is to provide this service or to build this house or whatever that thing is, it's the outcome that matters. The structure of the company is entirely a vehicle to get houses built or services supplied, right? And you can rebuild that structure. The structure is not the point. It's the outcome that matters. And the structure is just the thing that connects the people to the outcome. So the first thing is, all, whatever initiative it is, it has to absolutely, people have to acknowledge and really take on board that they may have to change. It's not about us, not about them. Um, and the other thing is that I think whatever initiative it is, and I think there's lots of possibilities, there's got to be an acceptance that this is a long-term game. Action has to happen now, but if you want more women, they're not just going to pop up, right? They're not just going to appear like mushrooms overnight. You need to provide an environment for them to grow. And I cannot tell you how many times I've seen, actually mostly in the TV industry, people would hire a woman. They're like, oh, we've hired a woman. We're feeling very good about ourselves. We don't normally have women directors doing this kind of thing. And then they just drop them in it, right? They'd have, they'd have promoted them a bit too early because they really wanted a woman and they'd just give them no support. And this woman would be miserable and would do a terrible job. Neither of those things were her fault. And then she wouldn't do it again. And so in a way, this, this urgency to get women in posts, can, it can set them up to fail and actually deter them. And so it will only work if you take people as they are, accept they have potential and take responsibility for giving them the opportunities to grow. Um, you, what you can't do is just expect a woman to appear somewhere and be magically exactly what you think you want. No, skills have to come from somewhere. Experience has to come from somewhere and it takes time. So although action is needed now, the attitude has to be, we are going to invest in this person over the long term. And, you know, it's not, this is not, you know, this year's initiative, we're going to sort out our gender balance and then move on. No, this is, a, this has to be growing. You know, you're sort of, you're taking people on board, you have to nurture them. And if you don't do that, you are not doing your job. Thank you, Helen. Um, 
I'm going to turn to Susan now, because I know you wanted to come in on this question and actually um, then just go around the entire panel and give everyone just a, you know, a moment, a final thought that you would want to share about um, how uh, we can come out of um, this very difficult period. Um, you know, what kind of possibilities has it opened up to create a fair, more equitable, and more enjoyable work environment, um, you know, that is, um, you know, gender equal. So, Susan, you're on the spot. I wasn't, you're, I'm coming to you first because you wanted to come in on that question, yeah, but no, I also I want to give you your thought on that. On the last question about one thing, I mean, just to Helen's word about outcome, when I use the word outcome in this area, I don't mean the outcome like how many, um, you know, how many houses are produced. I mean, the actual outcome of the efforts around gender equality, meaning that I don't want to just a list of actions. I want to know, did they work? You know, are these women developing thriving careers? Not, did you hire them and they left six months later kind of thing. Um, and just also to, to Miriam's point, my, my example of Airbnb was not at all to say that it's not right in front of us. It's of course it's right in front of us. And I've been in Silicon Valley for 25 years. And I, you know, and there are all kinds of things that are tech industry specific. It's just to say that even when it is right in front of us, people don't see it. Um, and even people who are kind of willing, and I think, you know, Brian Chesky at Airbnb was actually willing, but it was just, um, it was just, you know, it was missed. Um, I guess what I would say, just in, in closing, is that this really is um, an existential question for organizations and for society. And we have to get this right. And it's part of two larger questions. One, um, what is the social contract? And this comes back to Miriam's initial point about it's not just what's happening in the workplace, it's what's happening at home. And I, you know, and I would add is what's happening in society more broadly. And the second is where does this fit in terms of the larger effort um, that an organization makes in terms of defining its ethics? And I mean ethics even above and beyond the law, above and beyond fraud and corruption and all of that. Um, how the organization is gonna define um, its values, how the organization is define its identity, how the organization defines itself as a stakeholder in the world um, relative to things like climate change, for example. So I, I think this is an existential question. And as a result, I think it needs to continue to grow in terms of the attention that it gets and the rigor with which, it, with which it's treated, um, both in terms of the decision-making um, process and outcomes, uh, in terms of the data and in terms of the accountability. And I'll just end on that word accountability. I don't think that we're going to get anywhere with any actions or any decisions even without accountability. Thank you very much, Susan. Helen, same question to you. Final thought on um, what you would like to see um, as we go, as we move forward. So I guess I'm the academic, so I'm allowed to be a little bit idealistic. Um, and, and I think that what I hope will come out of this is that uh, humans, you know, there's a big period of change and things that, different things are going to happen next you know people get to choose in a sense their behavior and what i hope is that they choose to be better humans and what's good about this i think is because ultimately that has to yes yes i absolutely agree you need hard accountability you need hard responsibility for getting things done but fundamentally the reasons for doing this is that there are better ways of being a human being than what we're doing now and what i what you see, what what really makes change happen you know change kind of comes from lots of places but some of the biggest changes come from the bottom up they come from individuals remembering to do a little thing or remembering that they should challenge this behavior and if we show that being a better human in all of and i know that probably sounds kind of hokey to a lot of people but there are there are better ways to run the system. We don't have to do it the way it was done before just because that's the way it was done before. So if we see someone and we see someone else challenge something, oh, that's, I really admire that person. We can do that next time. Like you give permission through your behavior for other people to be better humans. So, so if, if people are, you know, if you're sitting in a boardroom or whatever room it is and there's people and no one else is bringing up these issues, you can be that person. You can be the person that says, actually, we should be thinking about this. And you raise the tone of the debate and every Everyone remembers your example and then everyone is encouraged to think in terms of being a better human because I, th I think the world needs rebalancing quite a lot and you know I'm a, I'm a climate scientist effectively I think about us in the context of our planet and how we can survive on this little island in space um, with the res with a limited amount of resources uh, you know with minimal conflict and all of that kind of stuff and there's a bigger picture and, and we have to 
we have to think of how to be a human on this planet. And the more we all do the little things as well as the big things, the more we give other people permission. So what I want to see is people giving themselves and other people permission just to do things better. Even if they've never seen anyone doing it better before, they can be the first one. And that is an incredibly powerful thing. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, Miriam, final word to you um, on this question about um, what you hope for going forward, a fair, more enjoyable working world. And please mention Inspiring Girls. Uh, tell us about that. Well, what I would like to see going forward from this terrible situation that we have now is at least to see flexible working being a clear option uh, for everybody using all the many digital tools that we have discovered during this uh, pandemic. I also hope that we can uh, use the momentum uh, that having to deal with these lockdowns, lockdowns has created to tackle once and for all the invisible work, the invisible burden that many women all around the world, even in the best countries on gender balance, even in those countries, women continue having burdens that men don't have. So I hope that, that now that we have seen that magnifier put on those issues, we can use it to generate some possible discussions as to how to deal with it, because we don't even have the ideas as to how to deal with them politically, not just as at an individual uh, level. And going forward, what I also hope is that all of us spend more time thinking about what happens with the next generation. In Inspiring Girls, the, the organization that I lead, we do a lot of work on trying to bring female role models to girls so that the girls discover the many things that women already do. We bring women at all levels of all different ages, not only the very successful ones, everybody. And we try to have a discussion with them about choosing without taking into account gender stereotypes. We keep finding issues of lack of self-confidence at around the age of 12. We keep finding issues of fear of failure at around the age of 12 that do not really apply so much to boys. And we see that from the age of six, boys and girls start looking at jobs like jobs for women and jobs for men. With a little bit of help from all of us, this is not rocket science, this one is about showing ourselves to them, we can really sort out this issue. And I hope that we all keep thinking not just about the issues that affect our peers or our workplace, but also the next ones that are coming in the next generation. Thank you very much, um, Miriam. That actually reminds me of um, something um, that we did on social media um, a little while ago, which is hashtag what an economist looks like. Um, and we economists would, um, would show uh, what we uh, look like in it. Um, it is, as you say, it is about thinking about the next generation. Um, it's been a brilliant discussion. Um, I just want to give my huge thanks uh, to Miriam Gonzalez Durantes, to Helen Chersky, and to Susan Leotold. What a terrific way um, to discuss, um, I thought, in a, in a very stimulating and um, really thought provoking um, all the issues around um, gender equality um, and the many, many. Um, issues that we still need to look at going ahead on this um, International Women's Day. Um, I'm Linda Yu, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to uh, chair this um, panel um, organized by I Connections and Intelligence Squared. So thank you to all of you for tuning in um, and happy International Women's Day. Mm -hmm.